Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and welcome to Wormholes Part 2. This is a follow-up to the previous 360 video, where we are going to look at more wormhole stuff, but we don't need the 360 stuff, because you don't need to turn your head around. I, I want to explain how I did the rendering, the mathematics behind it, give you an opportunity to step outside of the space-time and look at the universe as defined uh, by the wormhole geometry so that you can get a better idea of what's going on. So the first thing I want to start with is to let you see what other objects going into the wormhole look like. Now, unfortunately, I haven't programmed anything more complicated than this textured sphere. In fact, I messed up the texturing and it's mirrored. But this is what happens when we drop or we project an object through the wormhole. It just like flies straight ahead. But what happens if it comes from the side? Well, of course, it flies in from the left and our view of it changes because of the way space-time is being curved. It obviously doesn't keep going to the right. Instead, it appears to curve around the edge of the hole and go away from us. Similarly, we can, of course, bring it back out. You'll also see on the left and the right there are echoes that were there uh, that were being refracted around. Now, those echoes, if you have an object that's on the far side of the hole coming straight towards us, obviously you can't see straight through because there's a window into the other universe or the other space there. But yeah, the, an object on the far side of the wormhole from us looks just like a ring of light. And that's true regardless of which universe that object is in. And we can illustrate this by orbiting the object around the wormhole. This is an object on our side of the wormhole. It's entirely outside of it. And you see the gravitational lensing around the outside. So we're going to progressively put it deeper and deeper inside. This is an object which is halfway inside the wormhole. You'll notice that when it's on the far side, you get this entire ring of light. But you'll also get a reflection or a refraction when it's in front of us. This is orbiting at the center of the wormhole at distance zero, essentially. It's traveling between those two infinite planes, if you remember. And again, look at the ring. You have two rings that form at different points. When it sits on the far side of the wormhole now, this is on the far wormhole mouth, notice you now get this double ring when it is orbiting around the far side. And when it's finally beyond the far side mouth, you still have the two different rings at two different times, but they don't occur simultaneously. So now I want to talk about how we make these images. We use ray tracing, which means if you imagine the observer is at that point where all the blue lines come together, we are tracing those rays backwards to find out where they came from. And you can see the ones that are going to the left are hitting the green outer line. What we do is we then extrapolate those to infinity and figure out where that is on the skybox. So if you imagine that we put a texture along that green outer line and that's the pixel that we return. But if you look at the blue lines that go to the left, you'll see that they are curving around this hole in the middle. That's where the wormhole is, although the light can't actually go into that black space in the middle. But the curvature of the space-time is allowing those to go in different directions, and that is what accounts for the lensing effects near the mouth of the wormhole. Now, those red lines those are the ones that actually went through the wormhole. So you see that it starts as blue on one side, and then when they cross the midpoint, they switch over to red. And these, of course, continue on the other side, and they can also be projected to a point on the outer ring, but on the other side. And that means instead of using the first skybox, we use the second skybox. So we basically have two spheres at infinity, and depending upon which side we're on, that's where we map our ray to. This is actually a good place to kind of divert and talk about the geometry of the wormhole. You can see now the constant width throat and uh, just above that and below that are the mouths on either end. And then you have this curve, which uh, of course extends off into infinity. This is an embedding diagram is what we call this. It shows what the wormhole would look like if you could take a slice off it in two dimensions and then stretch it out into three dimensions so that we higher dimensional beings can see this. Obviously, you then have to imagine that this whole thing itself is furthermore extruded into a third dimension and you have to be a four dimensional or five dimensional being to really actually experience the whole thing. Now we can use this same diagram and we can make the observer or the source of these red and blue lines move back and forth through the wormhole. So this is just changing the radiating point. Technically the rays are all converging on this point, but we 
uh, you know, we followed the rays back in time to figure out where they came from rather than projecting the light outwards. It's a subtle distinction which really matters when you're doing proper relativistic stuff because you can have horizons and, and things in, rel in general relativity where the light rays can only go in one direction. But these are traversable wormholes as defined by Kip Thorne, so therefore they have no horizons and the light rays can will uh, go happily in whatever direction we need. They're also the highly tunable wormholes that were designed for interstellar, so we can tweak the mass parameter, which changes the smoothness of the curvature around the throat. Now again, as we bring the mass all the way down, it makes space become flatter more quickly, but it actually means that the curvature near the mouth is much higher. As you raise the mass up, the curvature extends further out, and you see these blue rays spinning around and getting captured inside the hole because the geometry of space it compels them to do this. Another parameter we can change is the diameter of the hole. Now we're keeping the observer at a fixed distance from the halfway point in the wormhole there. So as it expands out, it occupies a wider area of the sky and therefore more rays get captured into it. These green circles are supposed to measure constant distances from the mouth of the wormhole. So they are they look slightly different depending upon where they are because of course space has curved if you try to measure pi using these circles you will actually get a value which is less than the 3.14159 that we actually enjoy in our flat boring universe of course measuring pi is kind of hard because you can't actually get to the center of that hole since it's a non-existent place Anyway, the other thing we can do is change the length of the wormhole, and in this case, uh, the observer actually is being kept at a constant distance from the center of the wormhole. Therefore, as it gets longer, they're going further and further inside. What you'll notice is that during uh, the rays that are inside that, they just spiral around in a constant pattern. They don't change any angles or anything as they progress through the wormhole. That's why you see more and more of these rings as we extended the wormhole in the 360 video because the rays would spend more time zipping around the interior and you would have many, many more reflections or duplicates of the outside. So anyway, much of my start on this is based on the paper that was written by the visual effects team on Interstellar in collaboration with Kip Thorne. And in this paper, they set out the mathematics needed to do ray tracing in curved space times. Now, uh, in ray tracing, you're basically following a ray through space until it intersects something. To know where it is, you need to have a coordinate system. Most video games would use a Cartesian coordinate system, X, Y, and Z. Almost everything in computer graphics is designed around this coordinate system. Unfortunately, it's not very good for wormholes. Wormholes have, for a start, two separate spaces. Something that's slightly more appropriate is the polar coordinate system, where you measure something based upon the distance from the origin and two angles that tell you where it is in space. So you can imagine this being based on latitude, longitude, and altitude. Now, as you go down in this case, instead of going all the way to zero, you instead cross into the wormhole and your distance stops decreasing. So instead of using distance from the center, you use distance from the center of the wormhole, and that's measured in this value L here. Uh, so as you go upwards, that becomes L is positive, and as you go down, L gets negative. And the great thing is, you can use the same um, you know, latitude and longitude coordinates for all of space and then just change your L back and forth between plus infinity and minus infinity and that's you traversing from one space to another. So at all points you can define a sphere which you can you know, travel around. This is why even in the middle of the wormhole you can travel across the surface of this internal sphere and loop around. That's how we get the whole traveling between the two different layers. Anyway, that's just to get an idea of the coordinate system. Now, the next thing to understand is that the light doesn't go in a straight line, and unfortunately, there isn't a simple analytical solution. So what you do is you integrate it. You step forward, you figure out how much it should bend, and then you take another step. Technically, it's more efficient to do four little sub-steps. This is something that some mathematicians figured out. It's called Runge-Kutta integration. 
And uh, yeah, so we take that and you just need to know how to do the math for each of these little steps. And of course the paper lays all these out and it looks kind of complicated, but most of this is actually just accounting for the fact that we're working in a kind of polar coordinate space. It doesn't take much code ultimately to do this. This is of course called uh, multiple times per step. Each ray might take hundreds or even thousands or even millions of steps. And of course, there are millions of rays to be traced in a single image. It takes a while, but sure enough, we got these images out. But this was not perfect. It did take a very long time. But what I got more concerned about was this black line that's forming along the, the middle. When you try to follow a ray through the middle of spherical polar coordinates, it kind of grinds to a halt because there is a singularity there. And I don't mean this scary kind of physical singularity you have in black holes, which will destroy you. No, this is just a coordinate singularity. If you think about it, if you go to the North Pole on our rather more mundanely shaped Earth, you will be at 90 degrees latitude, but you won't know what longitude you're at because every single longitude line meets there. And very small steps near the North Pole can have a huge effect on your longitude. So when I'm stepping the rays forward using my Rungi Kuta, then I have to take very, very small steps when you're near the poles. And that means that your computer just grinds away and produces these black lines there. Or you just let it go fast and you get you know, glitchy bad data in these regions. So the paper specifically mentions that if you're rendering, you should probably choose a camera that is away from these regions so it doesn't actually see them. And that's fine if you're making a movie because you can you know, select where your camera is pointing. But I wanted to do a 360 movie, therefore I can't stop the camera pointing in any one direction because it has to point in every direction. So I looked at the problem again and realized everything in the two-dimensional plane is easy. It's only when you start going up and down that things start to get complicated. So I just changed the coordinate system for every new light ray so that every light ray ends up being rendered on the equatorial plane. And that actually makes the rendering really, really fast. In essence, we're rotating the equatorial plane so that the pole will never, ever end up in any of our pixels. So we don't have to take tiny steps near these poles. Even better than that, because we've taken a three-dimensional problem and made it a two-dimensional problem, we can get rid of some extra math. And that made it twice as fast, but it could still take hours to produce a 4K frame. The real boost of speed was to realize that once you'd calculated your deflection angles for any particular frame, you could reuse those angles for any other frame. So you just did one plane, reused your numbers, and suddenly I was rendering 16K resolution frames in about 10 seconds. And the reason I was rendering in ridiculous 16K resolution was because I didn't want to spend time writing an anti-aliasing algorithm. So instead I just rendered them supersized and then scaled them down and let Image Magic fix them. It turned out that I actually took more time for Image Magic to downscale the images than it took for me to render them in the first place. Anyway, I will probably post the code at some point on my Patreon, but uh, I am planning the next thing is to do some proper black hole rendering with relativistic effects. And to have rotating black holes, that will ruin my ability to use this final rotation trick. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the tricks I've learned will still make the thing a little faster than it once was. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little wormhole experience. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.